All right, the webinar is recording. So welcome everyone to irrigation orientation. My name is Yi Ling Zhuang. I'm the water resources uh, regional specialized agent uh, in UF IFAS Extension Central District. Uh, I'm housed in Mid Florida Research and Education Center in Apopka. So welcome to the irrigation orientation series. Uh, today it's uh, August the 5th. So you can see from this agenda, we are already close to the end of this series. Uh, so far we've covered a variety of topics uh, related to residential irrigation. So if you miss any talks uh, and you want to access your recording, please send me an email. I will put my email address in the chat box. And I will also to let everyone know we are building a web page now. So later at uh, MREC, Mid Florida Research and Education Center webpage, uh, you can see we'll house all the recordings and the residential irrigation related fact sheets and educational material there. So please stay tuned. And today, uh, today's talk is, uh, how to maintain my sand outing grass. Um, our guest speaker for today is Ms. Amanda Merrick. She is the Florida Friendly Landscaping Agent in UF IFAS Extension, Marin County. So now let's welcome Amanda. Thanks, Elin. Welcome everybody. So like she said, my name is Amanda Merrick. I'm housed here in Ocala at the Marion County Extension Service. So if any of you are Marion County residents, I saw a Stone Creek and a couple of others. I spent a lot of time in those communities and I would love to help you guys with your lawn and your landscapes too. So feel free to pay us a visit anytime. Um, with that, our extension service, if you're wondering, you can actually come by. We have a master gardener plant clinic uh, where we have volunteers uh, Monday through Friday. If they can't help, then of course we have agents such as myself, uh, Maxine Hunter. We also have a small farms agent, a livestock agent, a water resources agent, and a brand new family consumer services agent that'll help with health and nutrition and some finances too. So this is a photo of our demonstration garden. Please come by, it's open 24 seven to the public. You can come see our lovely demo gardens that our master gardeners maintain. There's a signage for most of the plants and that's just a really good place to get some inspiration and ideas for your own landscape. We have a shade garden, a butterfly garden, herbs and um, edibles, and we also have the vegetable garden too. So uh, please pay us a visit anytime or you can always send me an email and photos. We'd love to see samples um, usually. And if we can't tell from photos or samples, then we uh, schedule site visits too. So this is us with the Marion County Extension Service for both UF and the county. We have a great partnership with both. And the benefit with Marion County Extension Service is if we can't figure it out here, we can always send samples up to the University of Florida Plant Diagnostic Lab, Soils Lab, and Nematode Lab to really figure out what is going on with your plants in your lawn. So why are you guys here today? Well, you're here to learn about St. Augustine grass, right? I got a few emails from some of you before the program, many calls recently, not just with St. Augustine, but Zoysia too. This is the peak of the root rot season, many fungal disease, uh, making a happy little home right now in our lawns this time of the year. So we'll start on a positive note with why we love St. Augustine grass. It is the number one most popular lawn grass in the state. Zoysia is growing in popularity, but it's still nowhere near uh, where St. Augustine ranks. Folks like it because it is very dense and carpet-like uh, with very dark green blades. So that's why it's very popular in many neighborhoods and HOAs. One of the biggest benefits to St. Augustine besides its really thick growth habit it has the best shade tolerance of all of our grasses available to us here in North Central Florida. The dwarf cultivars really do the best with shade tolerance, but there's also a relatively new cultivar on the market called Citra Blue, named after the Citra Research uh, Farm, which is just north of our office. 
So Citra Blue was genetically uh, developed by the Citra UF Research uh, Center, and it has excellent shade tolerance, better disease uh, tolerance, but also very good drought tolerance too among all the different varieties. So um, the other benefit to St. Augustine, it has, it tolerates a really wide range of soil types which is why it is also utilized in so many neighborhoods and HOAs. If any of you have ever tested your soil pH, which we always encourage you to do um, before you invest a lot of money in re-landscaping or resodding, or if you're having issues, the first place you should start is with your soil pH, which we can test here in-house for just $2 a sample. So the benefit to St. Augustine is it can tolerate those higher pHs that we usually see in HOAs, new developments and new neighborhoods. We, I mean, we've seen pHs in the nines before. It's not unheard of. With the builder's sand and builder's clay, it's not the best soil. So fortunately, St. Augustine can tolerate that, whereas a grass like you know, Bahia and certainly centipede just simply won't. St. Augustine establishes very quickly by solder plugs. You really can't get it in seed. The seed's not viable here. So sod and plugs is the way to go. So why we hate St. Augustine? And many of you are like, maybe. <laughs> so unfortunately, just like all of our grasses, St. Augustine has its issues. Uh, it does require supplemental irrigation to remain green. So Bahia grass is the most drought tolerant grass we have here in North Central Florida, but it doesn't have that real dense carpet like growth like St. Augustine does. So if we have a, you know, several weeks of hot dry weather usually happens in the spring, March, April and May, we are typically pretty hot and dry. Yes, your St. Augustine is going to need more irrigation than say the Bahia or the centipede will. However, usually the number one reason for most of our diseases is too much irrigation, which we'll get uh, into here in a minute. Just like zoysia, St. Augustine also produces thatch. It's just kind of the nature of the grass. No, leaving the grass clippings on the lawn does not contribute to thatch if you mow it appropriately. So the general rule is, a, making sure you're not scalping it, which is if you have a lawn service or if you yourself mow it, making sure you're not mowing it straight down to bare soil. You never want to do that. You only want to remove about a third of the blade at any one time. So it does produce thatch just by nature. It does have pretty aggressive runners. Um, any of you that have St. Augustine and landscape beds, you may have noticed the runners kind of creeping into your, your beds a little bit. That's how it grows. And when it's happy and healthy, those runners are very good at what they're doing. Uh, unfortunately, many folks don't like how coarse the blades are in some St. Augustine varieties. There are some that have finer blades, but they're, they're still kind of rough to the touch, honestly. One thing too, Floritam St. Augustine is the number one variety. It's the most popular variety of St. Augustine we have. Unfortunately, it was developed back in the 60s. Since then, it has been overused, overplanted, used and abused so much that it's really lost just about all of its disease resistance. It's not drought tolerant. And you also really have to be careful with your herbicides. Even herbicides, which are weed killers, labeled for St. Augustine grass, many of them will have a star that says, do not use on Floritam, or at the very least, making sure you don't use it during the spring green up season, okay? And like I said, they're all susceptible to something and St. Augustine is no different. It is susceptible to many serious pests and diseases. Chinch bugs, which Zoysia can also get, but their favorite food is, St. Augustine. It can get large patch, root rot, dollar spot, just like all the others. It is unique in that St. Augustine gets gray leaf spot, which is a fungal disease specific to St. Augustine. And of course, our little nematode friends, which I'll show here in a bit. 
So St. Augustine, yes, we are getting inundated with coals this time of the year with root rot. This is a photo here that I took of a resident with, who was suffering from root rot. It's very, very common in those swale areas, those low lying spots. This was a customer that I did a site visit for. She was having issues, so we went ahead and ran her irrigation system. Sure enough, these areas, there were some major leaks around these irrigation heads that she wasn't aware of. She was already overwatering as it was, but then with these broken heads, the water was just pooling along the side of the, uh, the road. And also, if you take a look, what do you notice a lot of in this photo? Shade. So even though St. Augustine does have the best shade tolerance, it still needs about five hours of direct sunlight to really be the strongest and happiest and healthiest. So shade was an issue. And of course the over irrigation, particularly with the broken heads. The root rots, this is a close up. Um, you can have root rot and you never irrigate. It's kind of just the nature of Florida. We're hot, we're humid. I don't know about the rest of y'all, but here in Marion County, it's practically been like a hurricane these last couple of days with all the rain. So my yard is, it's a Heinz 57 mix, but primarily St. Augustine. We'll get areas with root rot in our yard and we, we don't irrigate. We don't have an irrigation system. So you can unfortunately just get it just being the nature of where we're at with our climate. But ultimately the root rot is caused by too much wetness around the roots. So this photo is a really good demonstration. These folks had a root rot all along the side of their landscape beds. And we find it very commonly in the swale because this neighbor is irrigating, this neighbor is irrigating. Plus you have the rainwater that is meant to, according to building code, pool in that spot. So these folks, were also watering, you see these big uh, established shrubs. They were also irrigating those shrubs that really don't need the irrigation. Once they're established, they're older than two years old, you can cut those zones off. So this area, you can see where it's all thinning and dying back from root rot, from too much runoff, both from the shrubs, the lawn, and of course the neighbor's irrigation in that swale. So. Most of the damage is seen in the hot, wet months, but we have seen and gotten positive root rot results even in the winter months. So it seems to be practically a year round issue. If it's not root rot, it's some other fungal issue, which the, again, the underlying factor is too much moisture. So you can also look for on the roots. St. Augustine is really, really easy to identify root rot because it usually has really thick roots. St. Augustine grass, if it's healthy, try pulling up a plug. It is hard. Those roots on a healthy St. Augustine lawn, they can be six, seven, eight inches long, uh, kind of like a whitish brown cover, color and covered in root hairs. What do you see here? It's short, black, stubby, and no root hairs. So that is our friend root rot. Large patch, we, we get practically across the board. Um, all of the warm season grasses can suffer from large patch. Uh, St. Augustine is no different. We usually see this in the spring. So large patch will actually start in the fall and it overwinters while your grass should be brown. Then come May, when you're expecting the grass to green up, you're left with these big unsightly patches. And that's called large patch, which is directly related to overwatering in the winter months. So we'll get to that here in a minute, but it's critical to avoid large patch um, to reduce your irrigation in those winter dormant season. This is another picture of that large patch. Uh, most of the damage is likely November through May, and it doesn't affect the roots, but it does affect the leaf blades, okay, and triggered again by excessive water, but also over fertilization. Dollar spot, this one tends to get confused with uh, pet damage. We'll get calls from folks convinced that their neighbor's dog or somebody living down their road 
that their dog keeps urinating in the same spots over and over again. And yes, that can happen, but this is actually a fungal disease, another one called dollar spot. And I was just introduced to a brand new disease I wasn't aware of. Yesterday, we had a positive test result for a similar looking disease called rhizoctonia. Rhizoctonia causes the large patch, but it also has a summer month disease called leaf blight. And it looks very, very similar to this. So if you're seeing these little spots that kind of coalesce into a larger patch, the suspicion would be that dollar spot, which thankfully doesn't affect the roots, but it can be unsightly. Of all of the fungal disease, this one is not as bad. The summer rhizoctonia, unfortunately, is resistant to a lot of fungicides and root rots are real pains so that those take you know, a year or more to fully recover from. So the dollar spot is actually triggered by excessive thatch. So when we recommend dethatching, it's usually about once a year, once every two years. Um, if you're mowing appropriately and you're not over fertilizing, you may not have to do it that often, but uh, we'll show you thatch here in a minute. Nutrient deficiency is actually an underlying trigger for this disease. So if you have a landscaper that is fertilizing, it is actually Marion County ordinance that they should have a soil test done first before they fertilize. So they can send samples uh, for soil to be tested to the UF lab. You can also drop it off in person. It's $10 a sample and that'll test for pH, micro and uh, ma macro and micronutrients. So your phosphorus, your potassium, and then those micronutrients too. So it's always a good idea, ask your landscaper before they fertilize, if they've ever done a soil test. If not on your yard, then at least somewhere in your neighborhood. They can't possibly do a test on all the thousands of homes there is, but they need to at least do something somewhere near you. And like I said, the special disease for St. Augustine called gray leaf spot. This only affects St. Augustine. Most of the damage is seen during the rainy summer months. Hey, again, rainy summer season. Um, it'll start with these irregular patches that can actually mimic chinch bug damage. So if you ever have concerns, you know, always check or have your landscaper check. The chinch bugs are pretty easy to, to spot, but especially gray leaf spot, very characteristic oval shaped gray leaf spots with these dark purple or reddish brown margins. Trigger again by excessive fertilizing and irrigation, but also prolonged leaf wetness. So if you have an irrigation system, make sure you're not watering at night. So nine o'clock at night, 10 o'clock, 11, that keeps your grass wet all night long. And that's when you're much more susceptible again to getting pest and disease issues. So preferably have your irrigation come on you know, between about 4 a.m. and 8 a.m., somewhere in that window. So if you are new to Marion County or North Central Florida, this is what you want to see. You want to see a dormant brown lawn in the winter months. This is a good sign. You're like, yeah, you're good. It's brown. Um, like one of our uh, folks that we work with out on top of the world, he'll, he'll say to his residents, brown is a color too. So let your lawn go brown in the winter months. This is what you want to see. So your St. Augustine pests. Yes, chinch bugs are without question the worst pest in St. Augustine lawns. And one of those factors was like I mentioned with Floritam. Floritam St. Augustine came out in the 1960s. At that time, it was chinch bug resistant. So they planted it everywhere. Well, overuse, overplanting of one type of species is usually never a good thing, but also overuse of pesticides. The chinch bugs suddenly evolved to love Floritam St. Augustine. But they've also evolved to be chemically resistant because we've overused these pesticides way too much and when it wasn't warranted. So now we have this issue of superbugs that pretty much laugh at the chemicals we throw at them. 
So their peak damage is usually seen during, hey, again, warm summer months. They are more prone to drought. So if you have um, an irrigation system that's not quite working right, or if you have no irrigation system at all, and for some reason we're not getting the rain that we usually do, chinch bugs love stressed out grass, particularly in those hot spots. So usually we'll see um, chinch bug damage on the edge of a driveway or the edge of a sidewalk, sometimes at the corner of your driveway and the road. Those are called hot spots where the irrigation isn't quite hitting right. So that's where you sometimes tend to see the chinch bugs start and then it spreads pretty quickly. So with chinch bugs, it is critically important that you talk to your landscaper and I would hire a professional. I would not try, try to uh, treat for chinch bugs yourself. It's just, they're so resistant and licensed uh, pest control operators, they have access to chemicals that we as homeowners simply don't. So I would recommend you hire someone to help if it's been confirmed that you have about 20 to 25 chinch bugs per square foot. About 30%, I believe that was the statistic. Yeah, about a third of all St. Augustine grass has chinch bugs. It just, just because you see one doesn't mean you need to panic. I mean, if you have St. Augustine grass, you're gonna have chinch bugs. But once you get to that threshold, 20 to 25 per square foot, yeah, it's, it's time to start treating. And the real difficult problem is with chinch bugs, they have multiple generations. So your landscaper can treat, it'll kill the nymphs, but it won't kill the eggs. So that's why you may see recurrence. Right now, Captiva is currently the only resistant variety available. The Citra Blue I mentioned does show in preliminary studies to be more resistant to, but right now we definitively know that Captiva is currently the only resistant variety against chinch bugs. Nematodes, if you've never seen, oh, go back, oh, there we go. If you've never seen a nematode, I don't know why it keeps doing that. Nematodes are microscopic worms. They, you cannot see them. So we actually, when we are suspecting nematode damage, it looks very much like root rot because they kill the roots. So the nematodes are microscopic. We have to send samples up to the UF nematode assay lab. And they usually, they're natural in our soils. Nematodes, like I said, come with the territory of being in Florida sandy soil. When they become a problem is when the grass is stressed. So if you're over watering and your grass is really struggling with root rot, that's when those nematodes can really take advantage. So areas of lawn will be yellow and stunted. And we usually have to send samples up to definitively say it is nematodes because it's usually both. We usually have both root rot and nematodes side by side. The nematicides unfortunately are very expensive and they are controlled so only folks with a license can apply them. So the best defense against nematodes is to have a healthy lawn and maintain it appropriately. Mole crickets, not so much an issue. Uh, usually they're worse with overwatering. Grubs can be a, a, a pretty significant issue. We, um, these are those big nasty guys there. They're so disgusting. So they're actually the baby of a beetle. So if you see grubs, if you see one, again, it's just like a chinch bug. If you see one, not much to worry about. But if you're seeing areas that you just yank up and there's no roots, that's a good sign. You've got something underneath eating your roots. So dig up a couple different spots and see if you can find them. They're usually not hard to find. So the beetles are attracted to light. So if you have a security light um, on your front porch or a street light, they are drawn to lights at night. And so that can make you more susceptible. So again, just really try to avoid having a landscape company come out and like once a month, just routinely spraying pesticides, that's when we start creating issues that we see with the chinch bugs. If there is no bug to spray for, what are you killing? You're killing all the good guys, okay? So only treat when you need to, okay? 
uh, spot training is typically best. So this is just a quick little quiz. Can you identify what the problem is here? Okay. So you saw a few different fungal diseases and pests. If you ever seen clearly defined lines, or I've seen perfectly like perfect circles, perfect squares, that immediately should be a trigger in your mind that this is not past, this is not disease, this is actually human, okay? Only people can create these perfect lines. This was a client a couple of years ago that was afraid that they had some type of pest or disease. What we came to figure out is either the lawnmower was too heavy when we were in a drought situation and the tires created those ruts, or more likely he had a leak. So he was potentially leaking herbicide on his mower or his gate or whatever he was driving on and it was leaking as he was going back and forth. So if you see those perfect lines or perfectly defined squares, that's not pest or disease. That would be a human problem, okay? So let's move on to what St. Augustine wants from you to be happy. Don't overfeed it, don't overwater it, and of course, patience and understanding just like everything else. The best defense against pests and diseases is, of course, a healthy lawn, which starts with feeding it. So St. Augustine does need to be fertilized, um, particularly if you are on one of those yards that has a high pH. Uh, much above 7.4, St. Augustine will start to get chlorotic, which is a fancy way of saying yellow. Once it gets over 7.4, St. Augustine has a real hard time getting some nutrients that it needs. So that's why um, it is important to do a soil test before you fertilize. And if you or your landscaper does fertilize, make sure it's only when the grass is actively growing, which is spring to early fall. Right now, the best date to keep in mind is April 15th to about October 1st. So if you look down here, they actually used to, the old recommendation was March 15th, but research showed that even though the shoots, the leaf blades started to grow, it took a little while longer for the roots to really start get going in the spring. So ideally waiting till early April, you know, if they apply April 1st, I don't know, that's fine. So early April to October 1st, that's the time to apply your nitrogen, your phosphorus, and all of your micronutrients. If your landscaper or you wants to apply potassium, that's fine. Potassium is not a pollutant. An extra dose of potassium in the fall can also really help get your roots through the cold winter months. Potassium is a root builder. So you can put down potassium any time of the year. Some folks will add extra iron for good green up, and that's fine. It's really the nitrogen and the phosphorus, nothing much before early April or past October 1st. If you're fertilizing too late in the season with nitrogen and phosphorus, ultimately what you're doing is you're stressing out your grass, and that's when you end up with the large patch and other issues. Nitrogen and phosphorus are encouraging that lawn to keep growing, during the time of the year, it should start to be slowing down and falling asleep. Especially last year, we got some freezes in October. Last winter was really hard on a lot of our grasses and our plants. So again, remember that brown lawn, you want your lawn to go dormant, so let it, okay? We do recommend slow release granular fertilizers. So if your landscaper is coming out to fertilize once a month, have that conversation with them. More than likely what they're using is a quick release, a liquid water soluble fertilizer, which means four to six weeks, one good heavy rain, most of that fertilizer is gone and washed down into our aquifer in our springs and causing all sorts of havoc. So it may cost a little bit more money, but it's worth it both for the health of your lawn and to protect our water to use those slow release granular fertilizers two to three times. That's really all that the lawn usually needs. All right, watering. The number one issue that we see both in the plant clinic and as agents, the number one issue with lawns is over watering. 
your goal when you irrigate is to only irrigate about half an inch to three quarters of an inch each time you irrigate, okay? We can help you do a catch can test if you need to do that. There are um, actual, you can use tuna cans, you can use cat food cans, or you can actually get little rain gauge cups and you can run your system. The easiest way without math is just put those cans out in that zone, just one zone at a time, run it until you get to that half inch to three quarters of an inch. And that's how long you know to run your system to get that ideal depth, okay? Like I mentioned, best time to irrigate is between 4 a.m. to 8 a.m. That way the roots get nice and soaked. It gets down deep where you're encouraging that nice long root system you see here. And then the sun comes up and dries off the leaf blade. So you're less likely to get things like the dollar spot. Please never water more than two times a week unless you have a new sod. Obviously there's exemptions. But if you don't have a new sod, please never water more than two times a week. We have heard so many times landscapers will tell a homeowner, oh, it's not getting enough water. You know, water it three times, water it four times a week. And then we go out there and it wasn't an irrigation issue. It was root rot. That's why your lawn wasn't responding to the water you were giving it. It couldn't. The roots were gone. So it is also against water management district rules to water more than two times a week. Also, just because they say up to two times a week, that is not a recommendation. If it's raining, if it's summer, you can turn your system off. Turn it on once a week if you need to or on an as needed basis. But if you are here in Florida in the summertime and you are keeping an eye on the weather, simply turn your system off and turn it manually as you need it, okay? Or if that is a little too difficult, once a week is usually perfectly fine. Remember March, April, and May, we tend to be hot and dry. That would be the time of the year to irrigate two times a week. Once we get into the fall, really start tapering it down once a week, if that. And then when we get into the dead of winter, Honestly, the recommendation is once every two weeks, once every 10 to 14 days. You'll sometimes hear the water management district say, skip a week, that's their campaign. So only water on an as needed basis. So you're mowing and you're dethatching, just like it is a recommendation for you to take a multivitamin and get an annual checkup. It is a general best recommendation to dethatch your lawn um, about every two years or so when that thatch layer, which is right here, gets to be about half an inch to one inch thick. You can avoid too much thatch buildup too quickly by mowing at the recommended three and a half, preferably four inches. So if you keep your St. Augustine mowed nice and high, you're not scalping it, which is kind of tempting to do if uh, you miss a week or two because of the summer rains, try to avoid that temptation to mow it straight back down to where it should be. Remember, you only wanna remove about a third of the blade at any one time. Any more than that, you're leaving a really long leaf blade and that's when you can start really building up that thatch quicker, right? Avoid overwatering and over fertilizing, which feeds the thatch. And of course, broad spectrum pesticides that kill those beneficial organisms. You want to have a living soil. You want to have creepy crawlies in there decomposing that thatch. If you keep spraying, you're killing all those beneficial organisms and there's nothing there to decompose that old leaves and the old runners. And that's really where we can get some issues. Aeration, once every, you know, once a year, every two years, many of our communities, particularly like Stone Creek on top of the world, any of those new developments where there's a lot of builder sand, but particularly builder's clay, that soil can be like concrete. It's really difficult for the plants, for the roots to get down and get rooted, where they're like six to eight inches long. So aeration, you know, once every you know, one, or one to two years is really beneficial. Um, usually when you want to do that during the growing season, both the dethatching and then aeration during the growing season, because it can cause some damage to the lawn. And of course, lastly, patience and understanding, particularly if you have root rots like take all, 
the fungicides across the board work far better as preventatives than they do as treatments. So once you see the disease at the surface, particularly with root rot, that fungus has been active for a while. So even though you or your landscaper are treating with fungicides, you may still see it get worse before it eventually gets better. The ultimate goal with the uh, treatment of fungicides is any new growth, those new runners will fill in that bad spot and not get infected. So that's your goal is to kill the life cycle of the fungal disease. Insecticides, again, only treat when there is a problem, when the pest exists. There are no pest preventatives. So scout regularly. And like I said, if you see one bug, two bugs, don't panic. That's actually a good thing. You want to see bugs in your lawn, okay? But if it's starting to show symptoms, scout and check and have your landscaper check. If your landscaper has questions, we, we teach them regularly. We uh, provide our assistance too. So that's what we're here for. And of course, always allow time for your grass to rest um, and green up in the spring. So let it go brown in the winter months. We are not South Florida. That's a common misconception. South Florida, yes, your lawn can be green all year long, but not here, not in North Central Florida, if that's where you are. You want your grass to be brown and then give it time to spring up. Be very careful with the uh, weed killers during that spring green up period. That's when the grass will be most susceptible to damage um, when it's weak um, and susceptible while it's greening up. And never overwater. If anything you've remember, you've learned during this program, please, please, please do not overwater. So that is me. That is my phone number and my email address. Like I said, you can bring in samples. Please don't bring in dead samples. <laughs> we can't tell anything from a dead branch. Um, I've had folks bring me three blades of grass. I'm sorry, I can't tell much from that. So typically a four inch by four inch by four inch square uh, where the grass is starting to show symptoms can really help us figure out what the problem is. And if we can't tell from a sample, that's when we'll schedule a site visit for you. So thank you for coming today. And are there any questions? Yes. Thank you, Amanda. Okay. So could you briefly, uh, why do you not recommend using weed and feed? Good question. So the University of Florida put out a blanket statement some years ago that they don't recommend weed and feeds because the timing is wrong for one or the other. Now there's many weed and feeds on the market, but generically they have a pre-emergent herbicide, which is great with preventing weeds from popping up, but they also have a fertilizer. So for your spring and summer weeds, the best time to put a pre-emergent herbicide down is right around February 15th. But is February 15th too early to fertilize? Yes. So if you wait until April to put down the fertilizer, it's gonna be way too late for that pre-emergent herbicide to really do any lick of good. So you see the timing for one or the other is wrong. Some weed and feeds have a post-emergent herbicide. If you want to utilize that in April, go for it. Unfortunately, time and time again, I've seen folks kill their lawns with the inappropriate application of weed and feeds. We had a gentleman with Bahia lawn. He didn't read the label and his weed and feed had atrazine, which is a good post-emergent herbicide but kills Bahia grass. So really, really read those labels and making sure it's safe for your lawn. Ideally, you'll have it separate. You'll do your pre-emergent February, you'll do your fertilizer in April. Good question. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, another question is uh, ask about this webinar. So this webinar will be, um, we are recording this webinar. So all the attendees, um, not just attendees, 
Um, for everyone who registered for this event, you will receive an email from me with the PDF version of today's presentation and the link to the recordings. So you can watch it uh, um, uh, when you are available and feel free to share with your friends and family. In the meanwhile, uh, we are building a web page to house all the recordings and the educational materials. So, so when it's available, uh, you will get an email from me or you can also go to our web page. It's a MREC, UFIFS, uh, uh, MREC dot. Uh, I cannot remember exactly, but I will put it in the chat box. A little bit of shame. I cannot remember our website page, but it will be there. Um, and there's another question is continuing on the pesticide. Mm -hmm. So what type of pesticide will you recommend? Granular or spray? Gotcha. That it's really up to you, honestly. Either one. Um, many, it's the active ingredient you need to pay attention to. Um, so if you know you have a disease, there are active ingredients to look for. If you have a pest, there's active ingredients. Granular or spray, it really doesn't matter. It's what you can find and also what is affordable. So the the method. The mode doesn't much matter as long as you're following the label and applying it according to the instructions. Um, there was a question here that our head landscaper says, with zoysia in St. Augustine, they should be scalped to prevent thatch. And that is a big, big no-no. No, you should never, ever thatch a yard. Regardless of what type of grass, you should never, ever scalp it. And that does not prevent thatch. All, right. All that is going to do is stress out your grass and welcome in weeds. So never scalp your lawn. How to prepare spots of a dead area that did not come back the next year with grass patches. Ooh, so in that, if you're having areas that die and year after year, it's not coming back, I would strongly recommend testing it out if year after year it's not coming back, A, it could be nematodes that are sticking around and feeding on that new sod you keep feeding them, or it's also likely you have a recurring fungal disease. Once you get a fungal issue, it's very likely that you'll get it again. It'll be recurring. So test for both and also check your irrigation system to make sure you don't have potentially leaks or too much water getting to one spot. Question, how do you keep Bermuda grass growing in your St. Augustine? Oh yeah, that is a very good question. I'm glad you asked. Um, it looks like you live in a golf course community. If you can find that answer, please let us know. Unfortunately, Bermuda grass is a very prolific weed and it loves to come in on shared mowers through wind, through rain, who knows, Bermuda grass seeds tends to find its way no matter what you do. And especially if you're uh, uh, up against a golf course or in a golf course community, there's really no good way to prevent Bermuda grass from coming in, unfortunately. You can treat with atrazine, which is an herbicide safe, labeled safe for most St. Augustine grasses. Bermuda grass does not like atrazine, so it can kind of keep it in check. Usually doesn't kill it. You're probably not going to like the answer, but some usually when you have a lot of Bermuda, we typically just tell people to kind of find peace with the weeds and live with it because you're not going to get rid of it. I, I hate to say that, but it is a very prolific, troublesome weed. So, any other questions? I saw one hand up. So if you can put your question in the Q&A function, if you are late, you may notice the chat box is disabled. You cannot put your question in the chat box, but there's another function called Q&A just with two chat boxes. Please put your questions there. There was a question, is there a cultivar Bermuda grass that can be planted in areas where St. Augustine or Zoysia has died due to disease? Yes, you can. Um, if you are in an HOA though, make sure you get HOA approval. Even though Bermuda is very prolific and in just about every community, uh, make sure before you introduce Bermuda purposely to your lawn that you get HOA approval. Um, there are improved varieties of Bermuda grass. 
the biggest, and there's many, many, many different types. The biggest thing is just make sure you avoid that wild type uh, common or coastal Bermuda, I believe it's what it's called. It gets really, really tall and leggy and stringy. So if you want to, you can actually look up bermudagrass.ufl, or just put Bermuda grass in a Google search, but Bermuda UFL, and it'll come up with a whole Bermuda grass document with the cultivars to look for. Um, but there are many improved varieties that stay much denser than the common or the coastal. Could you please spell the name for the herbicide for Bermuda? Oh yes, atrazine. That's A, T as in Tom, R, A, Z, I, N, E. So many of the herbicides and weed killers labeled for St. Augustine have atrazine as the active ingredient. Atrazine is pretty toxic. So make sure you read the label instructions when you're applying it. So that's the issue with Bermuda. You, you can't over apply that atrazine. It's gonna take repeated treatment, but always follow those label instructions for the max amount. You're very welcome. Um, question, is there a good, Oh, is there a good compromise cutting height for St. Augustine as well as centipede? Ooh, okay. That's a difficult one. So yeah, centipede likes it short, which you are right. And St. Augustine likes it tall. Probably that three inches might be a good compromise. Um, I wouldn't go any shorter than that. Uh, preferably the St. Augustine does want it higher. Um, but yeah, I'd probably say about three inches. I wouldn't go any lower than that. So it's interesting you have both because we, we do two on our landscape. We've got centipede and St. Augustine. My husband refuses to go to the 3.5. So he's at like three and a quarter. <laughs> I got him to three and a quarter. So even if you can do quarter inches, that's fine too. Okay. Any other questions? Y'all have a great question. So thank you. Great. So in the chat box, I think you already noticed I put a few additional resources as Amanda was talking. So when it's the Bermuda uh, resources, if you want to get more, uh, as I mentioned earlier, the web page. So it's merc.ifs.ufl.edu. So it's still building. When it's available, you will see it up there. Uh, I will say probably next month. Uh, I also put another link. It's just uh, all the details if you want to learn more about the lawn care, because uh, today will be the last talk related to your turf grass. Uh, in lab, uh, we covered the zoysia, and this week is uh, St. Augustine, and the next week we will switch to micro-irrigation. So it's, uh, it's quite different from your know, sprinkler head. So if you have Actually, you, if you should, if you haven't had any micro irrigation, we highly suggest you to have some uh, drip uh, micro irrigation. So you can find the, the registration also on, on our webpage that MREC, I will post another link in the chat box later so you can access all the uh, webinars. So with that, we will finish today's webinar. So I don't want to let you go before I post the link. So please get, just bear with me. Yes, and there's an extension office in every county. So if you are outside of Marion County, uh, feel free and we highly encourage you to reach out to your local extension service. They will be able to best provide you with the recommendations specific for your climate, for your area. Um, but if you are a Marion County resident, we would love to see you and hear from you if you ever have any issues. So but always reach out to your local extension service and your master gardeners for individual localized help. That's great, thank you. Yes, uh, like you see here, Amanda is with Marion County. So if you are in other counties, so we basically have at least one extension office uh, in each county. So find your local extension office, uh, um, ask them if you have any lands uh, landscaping questions. Um, I almost forgot that. Uh, so when we finish the whole series, uh, the end of August, uh, you will receive an email from me asking you to take a 
a short survey. That will be very important to us. So we will really appreciate if you can just take two minutes. It, I promise you it will be a short survey. Just tell us what you have learned and how we can improve this series. So with that, I appreciate everyone's time spending an hour with us. And also thank you, Amanda, for this informative uh, webinar. Hope to see you all next Thursday. Thank Bye. You. I did. I see one last oh. one last question. You just oh sure. <laughs> um, you asked about the neighbor using seed with rye grass. You can overseed with winter rye, but just be careful. There have been some preliminary studies that overseeding with winter rye can delay your underlying sod from greening back up in the spring. So. I'd say yes, you can do winter rye. There is no summer rye that is perennial. It's, it'll die off on you. So just be careful with it. So thank you, Yelin. Thank All you right. guys. Thank you, Amanda. Thank you, everyone. Bye, Bye. now.